Hello and welcome to Filling the Sink, a podcast from Catalan News. My name is Leah Bilaiva, and today we're talking about Carmen Balcells. Considered a revolutionary within the publishing industry, the Catalan literary agent Carmen Balcells was single-handedly responsible for turning the industry upside down. Not only that, she also played a significant role in the 1960s boom of Latin American literature. And all of this is just a fragment of her achievements. She passed away in 2015, and today, August 9th, would have been her 94th birthday. So, on today's podcast, we celebrate her birthday by delving into the life and legacy of Carmen Balcells and talking to some of the people closest to her, both professionally and personally. I'm joined today by Killian Shields. So welcome back, Killian. Thank you very much, Leah. How are you? I'm very good. How are you? I'm very well, yeah. I'm excited for this one. It's a cool, cool personality that we're profiling today. It is, it is. And the introduction was kind of spectacular, but why was she this important figure? She she had two major kind of standout achievements in the way that she kind of changed the whole industry, really. And the changes that she forced through single-handedly have become standardized since, not only in her own agency, but across the board, rivals. Um, it's kind of like just changing the rules of the game. And what um, kind of rules Exactly, that's the next question. What, what are we talking <laughs> about here. Uh, so there's two standout things, really. So one, she banished lifetime contracts. So this would be the case of an author getting a contract for a uh, work that they've done with a publisher. Uh, this was the traditional way before Carmen Balcells, and this would generally last a lifetime and also be across all markets. So she introduced a new way of working so that the publishing rights would be renegotiated again in five or six years or, or whatever it may be, what kind of time was stipulated in the contract. And this gave the author the chance to renegotiate their work or even move over to a different publishing house that would maybe offer them better conditions. So that that's one thing. This obviously gave the writer far more money, um, letting them live much more comfortably, letting them kind of focus on their work a little bit more and not have to be so stressed about such basic things like paying the bills, things like this. Um, so that's one thing. And then the second would be she standardized publishing contracts for different specific markets, which again, made authors so much more money. Uh, according to her own agency's website, the Agencia Carmen Balcells, she'll always be remembered for dignifying the writing profession. That is how the website puts it. And I think it's a really good, succinct definition of what she managed to do in her life. Mm-hmm. And she was also the agent of these huge well, that we now consider huge names, Gabriel García Márquez, mm-hmm. Isabel Allende, and, well, many others, right? Yeah, titans in the literary world. I mean, mostly from Latin America and the vast majority um, Spanish language markets as well, because uh, naturally enough, she was from Barcelona. This was the world that she was living in. But we've also got Mario Vargas Llosa. We've got Pablo Neruda, Julio Cortázar, Ana María Matute, Javier Cercas, Manuel Vázquez Montalban. I mean, the, the huge names, really, who've really transcended the literary world, also into the English language market as well. And then in addition to that, she also represented the works of six Nobel Prize winners in literature. Exactly, yes. We've got Miguel Ángel Asturias, Pablo Neruda, Vicente Alexandre, Gabriel García Márquez, of course, Camilo José Celá, and Mario Vargas Llosa. So in 60 years, six Nobel laureates in literature, that's pretty decent record. It is, it is. But let's rewind and go back to her roots, because she was born in the small village of Santa Fe de Segarra, outside of the western Catalan city of Lleida in 1930, to a family of small property owners. But how did she grow up to become involved in literature? It's quite interesting, really. After the Civil War, the late 1930s, early 1940s, she moved to Barcelona. And eventually she she graduated in accountancy and initially started working for the Guild of Knitting machine manufacturers. Okay. So a short time after that, her friend Joaquim Sabria recommended her to a friend of his, Bintila Oria, who was actually a Romanian exile at the time, who had a literary agency in Madrid at the time called Acer, A-C-E-R. She worked there as the Barcelona delegate for a short time until Oria decided to actually sell up and go live in Paris. 
So for a little while, Carmen was jobless, but she had already established contact with Carlos Berral from working in the publishing industry at the time, uh, who was from the famous publishing house from Seix Barral, uh, huge in the 50s and 60s. And Carlos offered Carmen the position of handling the foreign rights of the Seix Barral authors. Carmen, of course, accepted. Uh, she already had made loads of contacts in South America. And it's here in Seix Barral where her career really took off in the publishing industry. It's very important, really, time for her because this is when she really got to know things. And, and we have to really remember that the job of the literary agent uh, wasn't really in existence, really, in the Spanish market at the time. She was working for a publisher and uh, just negotiating contracts with, directly with authors. And she could immediately see the way that this industry worked. The position of the agent wasn't involved. It was just the publishers dealing directly with the authors. And naturally enough, in the business world, the publishers are going to try to pay them as little as possible so that they can keep as much money as possible. So Carmen Bassels could kind of see a gap here. Uh, say, okay, this relationship is perhaps a little bit exploitative. You know, these writers are getting a bad deal. So she could immediately see, you know, what was missing. And this, I guess, is where the idea formed in her head that she could be the person dealing on behalf of the writer with the publishing house, fighting for better conditions. And she founded the Carmen Balcells Literary Agency. And we also have to remember that she did all of this in a time where women weren't even able to open a bank account on their own because this was the Franco dictatorship in Spain. Mm -hmm. So women... The peak of it as well, 1940s, 1950s. Exactly. So women really had very, very little rights. So what she did was huge. Oh, unbelievable. Astounding. Like the magnitude of the achievements, I think, really uh, is, is immense. And tell me, Killian, who was her first client when she started her literary agency? Yeah, so it said that uh, Luis Goitisolo Gay was the first client at the Carmen Barcells agency. He's a local Catalan writer. Barcells also actually represented his brother, Juan Goitisolo. So a very famous Barcelona brother duo of authors. Mm -hmm, I see. And in 1965, so around 15 years after she opened her agency, she met this young, up-and-coming new writer. Who was he? This you're referring to, I think, would be Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's it's crazy to think now, like this guy was, um, you know, just starting to make a name for himself. But he's obviously become one of the biggest names in literature in the world of the 20th century and even now into the 21st. But of course, there was a time when he wasn't well known <laughs> and Carmen Bassels with her very strong literary intuition, very strong nose for finding talent. She toured Latin America to sign up writers in 1965. She found then Gabriel Garcia Marquez. She could see a talent in him. And he obviously became one of the flagship names of her business. A Hundred Years of Solitude, two years later, 1967, sold more than 30 million copies, translated into 37 languages. And you talked to Maribel Luque and Laura Palomares, who work at the literary agency of Carmen sales today and they knew her both personally and professionally so let's hear what they told you I'm Maribel Luque and I'm the literary director of, of the agency I'm uh, Laura Palomares I work as a literary agent in the foreign rights department here at the Agencia Literaria Carmen Balcells and I happen to be as well the granddaughter of uh, Carmen Balcells Laura obviously knew Carmen from birth, while Maribel first started working at the agency at the age of 18, so both are ideal people to ask what Carmen was like as a person. She was exactly the same as a grandmother as she was as an agent for, actually she was called La Mama Grande for um, the authors, so she was very generous, exaggerated, but she was very, 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 very intelligent. She had a unique personality. She was a complete force of nature, very, very, very generous, a hard worker with a wonderful and unique nose. She got very emotional with very little things. Suddenly you got her a drawing or something like that and was the best thing anyone had gotten her. And the same for the bad things. Everything was the worst thing that had happened was in that second. And that applies both to her personal side and her working side. Carmen Balcells took her boisterous personality with her into her professional life, often going above and beyond for the authors she worked with. She charmed the writers. Uh, writers really found someone 
who they could trust. She was not double-sided, she was what she was. And you could see there was like truth in what she was saying. With the editors, maybe it's not that, that good, you know, that exaggeration, but I think it formed her kind of known character and editors were afraid of her. And her responsibility or her will to do things was much beyond the, the literary agent tasks because uh, she, she handled personal life issues for her writers as well. She had a brilliant intuition, which is something can't be replicated or can't be learned. The job of the literary agent was practically non-existent before Carmen Balcells came along, at least in the Spanish language market. The role she played in the industry was a brand new one she carved out for herself, turning the industry on its head in the process. It was a, a revolution. She immediately saw the difference between having all those authors under the publisher umbrella or handling those authors herself directly by creating her own literary agency. She had already realized what kind of contracts all those writers were signing. Almost no money as advance, and they were contracts uh, for the whole term of copyright, um, for the whole world. I mean, of course, writers were living in, in very poor conditions and, and, and were almost slaves for the publishers. And she changed absolutely all this. The writer signed a license rights to the publisher, but for a limited period of time, five, six years. Once uh, you reach that period of time, rights reverted to the author so that you could recontract, resell the rights to a different publisher. Balcells even held influence over the highest governmental office in the country and used it to help authors. She went to Moncloa and had a very powerful conversation with the government at the point, it was the, the PP, Jose Maria Aznar, to change the way publishers pay taxes for their work. And that's the, the, the clause we know as close Balcells, the Balcells clause in, in the contracts. And all the other agencies learned uh, the ropes of the, of the job for, for all these um, strategies created by, by Carmen. She was unique, really. This is um, known as the Latin American Boom Agency. The Latin American Boom was a literary phenomenon in the latter half of the 20th century, characterized by the huge global successes of young writers from this part of the world. One author brought her to another author and then another author and then uh, the boom happened. <laughs> Many of the biggest names involved were clients of Carmen Balcells and the boom is sometimes in part attributed to her. I mean, that's what the legend says, you know, she created the boom. But I think she had the vision to get together and make literary relations between authors from different, very different countries, like it was like Peru or Colombia, that before hadn't thought themselves as a one unite thing. And I think she helped in that, but obviously the boom created itself. Laura is reluctant to get too carried away with the legend, though. Still, it can't be denied that Carmen Balcells was central to the success of so many of these careers. So what was it that brought it all together? Carmen Balcells' goal with all those writers was to professionalize their, their careers, their writings, their jobs, their works. And for that purpose, she was ready to handle domestic issues or the children, the school for children or whatever they needed so that they would not distract from the pure act of writing. I think she just helped them build something here and, and, and get a home and the practical side, you know, of, of uh, move to a country and having to, you know, earn money to survive and those kinds of things. I think that's what made them, you know, uh, decide to move to Barcelona and Barcelona became what, what it was, like the epicenter of uh, the Latin American boom. It can't be overlooked too that she helped many of these writers flee dangerous dictatorships in their home countries and bring them to Franco Spain. So what was it like for her to work under these conditions? It was a challenge because for example there was censorship in that time so books should, uh, they were going through censorship before they could be published so that was like one more step than there is in, in nowadays in, in democracy. But I think she was very smart to not position herself very much politically. Uh, she was uh, able to navigate the political system of the time in her benefit and she represented authors from all spectrum of politics and also she knew what uh, these authors were you know more right side or and they she never sat sat them next to another in a dinner 
thanks to Maribel Luque and Laura Palomares for speaking with us. Yeah, I just wanted to add as well that Laura mentions the censorship of the dictatorship in Spain in the 20th century. And I suppose it's appropriate to point out that this was, of course, during you know the Franco times when the Catalan language was prohibited, it was suppressed. So all the literature that we're talking about was, of course, in the Spanish language. Carmen Balsells, despite being a, obviously a proud Catalan, didn't really end up working with many authors writing in Catalan, obviously just for the political context of the time. And the kind of curious thing is that some of the Latin American authors that she represented, they went into exile both in Spain, but then also in other countries. Yeah, exactly. Just a few examples of these authors who had to leave their home country are Julio Cortázar, Mario Vargas Llosa, Juan Gelman, Isabel Allende, and of course, Gabriel García Márquez himself who went into self-exile from Colombia, his native Colombia. It was quite interesting. He, We mentioned before he came to Barcelona, and he wasn't really very much involved in the anti-Francoism here. Instead, he, he wrote about his home continents, Latin America mostly. And the thing that I find really interesting about these Latin American exiled authors is that they were, of course, also subject to censorship in the Franco regime. But the censorship wasn't as hard as it was for Spanish authors. Why Why was that? Yeah, I suppose there's probably two main reasons for that. I mean, one, like we just mentioned, the example of García Márquez. He was writing more about his home country. And, you know, if it's not concerning Franco, if it doesn't uh, insult him, if it doesn't depreciate his name, well, then I suppose he thinks, ah, it's fine. You know, we can, mm-hmm. we can let that slide. It's not bothering me. But then the other reason, of course, possibly more important, economic reasons. The business was good. The Cameron Balsell's agency was was doing very well. It was very successful. Money was coming in. So why rock that boat if it's not really damaging the Franco regime too much? Mm -hmm. And then in addition to that, also, when this Latin American boom took place in the 70s, Spain was also, well, in the late era of the Franco dictatorship, meaning that they were in this apertura, this opening phase, where the censorship wasn't really as strict as it had been before. Precisely. Yeah, it is important to point out that the Franco dictatorship had sort of different um, moods, shall we put Mm -hmm. it? Um, Like, yeah, there were different phases of it. The earlier stage was much stricter. Franco was younger. Obviously, in the 70s, he was very close to his death. And Spain had by and large, just was ready for a new phase, a new system. Mm -hmm. And she wasn't just beloved by the industry or the writers, but also acknowledged greatly by the different institutions. Absolutely. She received the Creu de San Jordi Award, which is one of the highest civil distinctions that the Catalan government can offer. She also received the Barcelona Medal of Honour, among plenty of other distinctions, and was given an honorary doctorate by the Autonomous University of Barcelona. In 1993 as well, she sold 50,000 books to the the National Library of Catalonia. And in 2010 as well, she sold her archive containing 50 years of contracts, letters, manuscripts, business diaries, all things like this, to the Spanish Ministry of Culture for the grandly sum of 3 million euros. Okay, and she retired in the year 2000, although she came back in 2008. And she got to witness all these new challenges that the editorial world was experiencing at the time. Yeah, totally. I mean, 2008, we're talking about the rise of the digitization. Carmen was a huge proponent of e-books. She was one of the early adopters of this new technology, and she pushed strongly for regulation of their licensing. Quite an interesting thing, as well as quite interesting. Maribel and Laura from the agency also explained to me that they're kind of undergoing a relatively similar fight over audiovisual rights with some of the big streaming platforms. Quite a similar fight that Carmen had with the publishers all the way back in her day. And it's quite interesting. There's going to be an audiovisual adaptation of Gabriel Garcia Marquez's 100 Years of Solitude, which is obviously really popular right now on Netflix. So the agency is having sort of a similar fight because they explained to me that many of these big platforms think that they are just kind of ignoring intellectual property. Uh, they think that they can just like turn any story into a film. And once they make the film, well, then grand, you know, that's that's ours, our intellectual property to use. They explained to me that this already represents around 30% of their business, just negotiating audiovisual rights licensing. Wow. It's obviously like a significant portion, more than I expected. Yeah, so this just goes to show that the agency now, they have, well, similar fights that they had back then, but just within a renewed context of audiovisual, of movies and those kinds of things. And as the agencies go on, so do we. And now it's time for the Catalan phrase of the week. What is it this time, Killian? Well, this week, 
we want to do something just a little bit different. Mm -hmm. We're here profiling an interesting, boisterous character, so we thought, why not, instead of a regular Catalan phrase, we go for a quote of theirs. So this one we've taken from that same Isabel Allende, Reuters 2008 interview. And the question that was asked of her was, when did you know that you wanted to be a writer? Asked of Isabel Allende. And she responded that in her third book, Carmen Balcells told me The House of Spirits was a good book, but that everybody can write a good first book because it's one's own story. (laughs) So she said that writers prove themselves in the second novel. So she started that immediately. <laughs> I thought that was nice. It was a nice kind of uh, look into Cameron Balcells, how she could uh, motivate, really, her writers to kind of drive forward. Exactly. But also kind of tough love, right? Yeah, like, yes, exactly. Th- she didn't say, like, oh, fantastic job. She said, yeah, yeah, everyone can write a good first book. And that's over. That's, that's done. What's next? Mm-hmm. We move on. We move forward. And that's all we have time for today. Thanks for listening. Please do subscribe to Filling the Sink wherever you get your podcast if you haven't already. Thanks again to Laura and Maribel. Thanks again to you, Killian. Thanks to you, Leia, for having me. And we'll be back again next week with another episode of Filling the Sink. On behalf of the team here at Catalan News, I'm Leah Bilaiva, wishing you a great weekend. Fin sabia. Adeu.